Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this important bill. First of all, let me welcome this bill that is introduced by the Honorable HRD Minister and compliment him as well for bringing the same energy for which he has recently been elevated to this very important ministry. Sir, as some of my colleagues have uh, already mentioned, this and the forthcoming bill on amending the IIT Act, which will also introduce new institutions. This one in Andhra Pradesh and the IIT bill, also another one in Andhra Pradesh, in Kerala, in Karnataka, in Chhattisgarh, Goa, Jammu and Kashmir, and also upgradation of another institute in uh, Bihar. Sir, I want to touch upon one issue that has been touched upon by a couple of my colleagues and extend the argument that what we are looking at here is not just extending the quantity of NITs and IITs throughout the country, but also the quality. And the issue of teacher shortage, which some of my colleagues have already referred to, is extremely crucial. So this is not just a few of us here speaking about it. Let me refer you to the last time that the NIT bill was amended a couple of years ago. Mr. Panda. The shortage is not only the appointments. Most of the teachers are going some other assignment work. The, actually, if you see that role, register role, the staff may be recruited, already may be there. Most of the people, some other assignment they're going abroad or some other subject. That is why I can't remember. Therefore, they have to fill up that immediately. That is another one uh, problem that most of the institutions, the as government institutions are facing that. Thank you for pointing that out, sir. I will, I will also touch upon it. Sir, it is not just a few of us members here mentioning it. I would like to bring to the Honorable Minister's attention that a couple of years ago, the last time that the NIT bill was amended, it was to take an institute in West Bengal and upgrade it, much like the earlier NITs were upgraded, and now also in Dhanbad, the Indian Institute of Mines is going to be upgraded to an IIT. And there was a, our parliamentary committee, which looked into it, made the exact same comment and pointed out that there is a tremendous dearth of teachers which is going to affect the quality. Sir, the numbers, the statistics cited by my honorable colleague from Kerala, who is not here in the house just now, uh, I have a little difference uh, in statistics from that because I have taken it from the ministry's website. But even the ministry's own website, sir, points out that in the IITs, there are 39% shortage of teaching staff. In the NITs, 29% shortage of teaching staff. In the triple ITs, 36% shortage of teaching staff. These are slightly different than what uh, Dr. Tharoor had pointed out, but I have taken your own statistics, so sir, you can't quibble with this. And as the Honorable Deputy Speaker has pointed out, this must be number one on your agenda to make sure that the training of teachers, the recruitment of teachers and instructors for these institutes is of the utmost priority. Sir, the irony is this, that the number of public engineering institutions, IITs and NITs included, are dwarfed by the number of private institutions that have come up in the whole country. Uh, there are between 1.5 and 2 million engineering graduates that are produced every year, but employability is very low. Look at this, sir. Recently, a Delhi-based employment solutions organizations called, organization called Aspiring Minds did a survey of 1,50,000 engineering graduates, and they found barely 7% were employable in core engineering jobs. This should not come as a surprise to us, and it is not just some agency that has done a survey. If I may cite, sir, perhaps the most famous engineer today living in India, uh, I think arguably one would argue is Mr. E. Sridharan, who has built the Delhi Metro among many other projects. This is what he has to say. To quote him, he, say, he blames the abysmal quality of engineers on the unbridled growth of private engineering colleges with no regulation. So the numbers are quite astounding. The number of private engineering colleges in Andhra Pradesh alone, where this new institute is being opened, is more than 700. There are something like 5,000 such institutes altogether. I, I stand corrected. I stand corrected before, because of the bifurcation, but I think the point is made, sir. Sir, out of the total number of about 5,000 engineering colleges in both private and public sector, barely 1,500 
are in the public sector. Let me point out, sir, why the public sector, the NITs and the IITs, are important, sir. I'm not against the private sector. Sir, I am a great votary of encouraging the private sector in many fields of commerce and job provisioning and uh, our economy. But, sir, the greatest institutes in the world are those that don't teach, that don't treat teaching as a profitable entity. Take, for example, sir, we have had references to Harvard and other universities of world repute. Some of us have had the opportunity to visit Yale University, one of the very best known universities in the world. And we were impressed, I think, to learn, sir, that although Yale's uh, fees that they charge students is quite high, it only represents 14% of the actual cost of teaching. Why is that? Because 86% of the cost of teaching at Yale is subsidized from the endowments. Honorable colleague from West Bengal was just talking about the very large endowments that Harvard has with more than many countries. This is the reason, sir, that our private institutions, which are churning out like an assembly line, these lakhs and millions of engineering graduates who are mostly not employable, have to be seen as uh, something of serious concern. Sir, this is why the public institutes are very important right from the days of uh, our uh, early republic from when Nehruji gave importance to the, uh, the highest teaching standards at some of these institutions. We have actually not kept up. We have actually been left behind as some of our colleagues have pointed out. Uh, let me point out, sir, in the top 200 universities and institutes in the world, only two of our Indian institutes rank. Uh, these two are uh, the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru has 147th rank. And the Indian Institute of Technology at Delhi have 197th rank out of the top 200 in the world. If we look at the other countries, sir, in the top 200 of the world, the United States has 49 universities. The UK has 30 universities. The Netherlands has 12. China has 7. Sir, the point I was trying to make, sir, is that while these private engineering institutes treat it like a commodity, they churn out like an assembly line, all these engineering, so-called engineering graduates who mostly are not employable, the difficulty is that because they are treating it with a profit motive, they are not investing in research. And the name of this bill, sir, is the National Institutes of Technology, Science, Education, and Research. The private engineering institutes are doing a much lesser job of providing the opportunities for research because it's not profitable. Research is going to take many years, maybe decades, to pay off. And they are not investing in that. And it is clearly evident in the number of PhDs that we have. Let's take a look at some of the statistics, sir. In India, as per the last provisional survey in 2014-15, about 1,13,000 students in, uh, uh, in India were registered for PhD studies. This sounds like a lot, but it is not. It is only 0.34% of all the students only registered for higher education, not counting school students and all. So it is one third of 1% of all our students in higher education are registered for PhDs. Let me cite something that is even more worrisome, sir. Because there are PhDs and there are PhDs. One of the important criteria we should be looking at is how many PhDs are working in science and technology related fields. Because while we must encourage the arts, as an honorable member from West Bengal has pointed out, we do need to provide a well-rounded education at the bachelor's level. At the highest levels of research, if our country is to go forward, we must invest in research. That's what this bill is all about. So let me point out, sir, if you look at PhD students in India, less than 20% of the PhD students are enrolled in scientific and technological areas. The rest are all in areas that are of the arts or related to that. Compare that with the US, sir. In the US, I'm sure the Honorable Minister is aware of this, 75% of all the PhD students enrolled for PhDs are in sciences and technology. 
Compare that, sir, with China. 41% of all the PhD students are doing their PhDs in science and technology related areas. In our case, 19 point some odd percent, less than 20%. This is what needs to change dramatically if the quality of our higher education, particularly related to NITs and IITs, is to improve and not just the quantity. Sir, I think the subject has been touched upon by many of my colleagues, and I'm sure the Honorable Minister is aware of all these issues, but I think it is important for us as the temple of democracy in this country to highlight these issues so that they don't get left behind in the other urgencies that government has to deal with. This is very, very important. Uh, I do support this bill with the caveats that I have pointed out, and I wish the Honorable Minister all the best in his endeavors to take our higher education in technology to higher levels. Right. Thank you.